Here's a little excerpt from the conclusion of Food Margins, with some pictures from my co-op to look at while you listen. Decades before avoiding gluten became a food trend, I was diagnosed with a wheat allergy. When I finally found a doctor who could make sense of my oddly variegated symptoms, he said something that stuck with me, something I often repeat on the first day of my food classes. You know, the gut is where we meet the world. My students tend to have the same reaction I did at the time. First, you, and then, whoa. The intimacy of it, the immediacy, can feel both invasive and intriguing. I still struggle with the invasiveness, but the fascination has stayed too. Humans are always connected to the world around us when we eat. But one of the things that anthropology teaches you is the importance of being very specific when you talk about people, cultures, societies, economies, times, places. So I emphasize to my students that this world, the one that can be so hard to digest and comprehend, is the industrialized world, pieced together out of fossil fuels and commodity markets and Western scientific knowledge and plantations and assembly lines and the modern hubris of thinking that we'll always be able to invent ourselves out of any problems we might invent ourselves into. Over the past couple of centuries, this industrialized world has become a kind of carapace that we live under and now mistake for the sky. It encases the entire globe, still expanding and reinforcing itself in some places, even as it renders others abject and uninhabitable. And everywhere, everywhere, it is brittle, often on the verge of breakdown, requiring massive infusions of capital and political will to maintain its fictions of limitless economic growth and the promise of middle-class prosperity for all. Many of us who've grown up under it start life with an inherently impoverished sense of how things might be different. Whether we inhabit zones of prosperity or of breakdown, we often have very little tolerance for dealing with the big paradoxes we live within, all those questions that resist answers. And yet, as the early months of the COVID pandemic showed, that tacit awareness of fissures is also present, and people will act on it in immediate and consequential ways given the right stimulus. The now regular extreme weather events of the changed climate, yet another historic drought in our part of New England last summer, this year rains washing out roads and flooding farmers' fields at the same time as we're blanketed with smoke from distant Canadian wildfires, bring more and more people in once comfortable places to the realization that the status quo is no longer tenable. Where to go from here remains a big open question. As a teacher and a writer, I'm always convinced of the power of learning, good critical learning, to point us in the right directions. And indeed, it's worth noting how many of the voices that have helped broaden our understanding of the problems within the food system belong not to planners or economists or political leaders, but to authors and filmmakers and educators, people with the skills to translate across often incommensurate languages and ways of knowing. As my students continually remind me, learning is not the same as taking action, but it can help inoculate us against simplistic or short-sighted or too hasty actions and distinguish an actual alternative from a facile or misleading one. And it can suggest ways to align ourselves with projects being built up from different foundations. These are everywhere once you know what you're looking for. People all around the world, this world, are imagining and acting on those ideas in both top-down and grassroots ways, sometimes in tension with one another, sometimes overlapping, dancing with both markets and legislative processes, and finding wiggle room in sometimes unexpected places. These efforts are inescapably political in the sense of dealing with power and collective decision-making. Working toward them can build and strengthen a body politic as well as requiring it. This isn't my attempt at the kind of blanket hopefulness that tends to show up at the ends of books about the global environmental crisis, the ones Elizabeth Colbert calls the additional three pages, explaining why we shouldn't give in to despair while careening into almost unimaginable disaster. 
Most or all of those projects are gappy, emergent, contested, as our little co-op still is. But one of the many things I've learned as an avocational grocer is that even when we don't know enough about what we're doing or have everything we need, we can still act in ways that are purposeful and generous and real. And if we've started in the right direction, if we can tell a true alternative from a merely cosmetic one and develop a tolerance for what it means to take some responsibility for keeping it going, then that is enough. In some ways, it is everything. Even those of us who have historically felt ourselves to be at the center of the modern world can cultivate the kinds of skills and awareness it has always taken to operate on its margins, where things are forever falling apart and endlessly coming into being. We are all on the edge now, and we all still have to eat. <laughs>